tonight. High Court sitting in Joss discharges and acquits former governor of Plateau State, Jonah Jang, of 6.3 billion naira fraud, says prosecution lacked evidence to prove the allegations against the accused. Governor Omaru's Pintiri raises alarm over moves by terror group Boko Haram to establish an operational base in Adamawa State, asks the military to intervene quickly. House of Representatives Committee begins assessment of daily fuel consumption in the country, ahead of the lawmakers' decision on the removal of subsidy on petroleum products. And Vice President Yemiyo Shibajo proposes a debt for climate swap deal as part of measures towards achieving a just and equitable energy transition for Africa. On business news tonight, global food prices dropped for the fifth consecutive month in August, according to latest report from the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. On sports news tonight, Ukrainian heavyweight boxing champion Alexander Yusek hopes to face WBC champion Tyson Fury in a unification bout next year. And from the nation's capital, members of staff of the Police Service Commission vow to continue their ongoing strike over the face-off between the Commission and the Nigeria Police Force. And in international news from London, Argentina's vice president has narrowly avoided being assassinated after a gunman's weapon jammed when he pulled the trigger. Former governor of Plateau State, Jenna Jang, is now a free man. It comes after the high court sitting in Joss today discharged and acquitted him of the 6.3 billion naira corruption charges leveled against him by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. A court presided over by Justice Christy Dampop has also discharged and acquitted a former cashier in the office of the Secretary to the Plateau State Government, Yusuf Pam, who was accused alongside the former governor. Justice Dabob held that the prosecution lacked evidence to prove the allegations of embezzlement and misappropriation against the accused. Counsel to the EFCC and the defendants bear their minds on the judgment. The judge analyzed all the exhibit standards, analyzed the testimony of all the 14 witnesses. 98% of these witnesses more or less testified in favor of David Jonah Jang. Each of them said not one couple was found with him. Not one combo was found in his account, or found in his wife's account, or found in his office, or found in his children's account, or found in his relations account, or found in any of his bank accounts. The court found this man innocent of all the 17 counts charged. And one would have wondered, why was this man being persecuted? instead of being prosecuted. But today, justice has been served. This case was initially before Honorable Justice Longji. And um, before that judge, the prosecution called 12 witnesses and closed its case. The defendants then made no case submission. Upon their no case submission, the Lena trial judge in that instance ruled that the defendants had a case to answer and the defendants were to enter their defense. But unfortunately, his lordship retired immediately after delivering that ruling. Now the case was brought before a new judge. The prosecution called 14 witnesses and tendered even more documents than the ones that were tendered before the former judge. This time around, the defendants surprisingly rested their case on that of the prosecution. So, but now the judge has ruled that yes, in respect of the whole 17 counts, none of the counts was established beyond reasonable doubt. In the meantime, the EFCC says in a statement it has initiated a process uh, of appeal to appeal the judgment. Well, still in Plateau State, the National and State Assembly Election Petitions Tribunal has nullified the election 
Honorable Musa Avia Aga of the People's Democratic Party as a member of the House of Representatives. A court held that Honorable Aga was not validly nominated by the PDP for by-election conducted on February 26, 2022 and did not score the highest valid votes for the by-election. The court also declared Mohamed Goni of the People's Redemption Party, who came in second, as winner of the election. Meanwhile, in Kogi State, the Federal High Court sitting in Lokoja has dismissed the suit filed against the candidature of Natasha Kotiudwahan for the Kogi Central Senatorial District under the platform of the People's Democratic Party. A court presided over by Justice Peter Malong upheld the preliminary objection filed and argued by Senior Advocates of Nigeria, Johnson Usman, on behalf of Akwati Udwahan, that the suit was incompetent. In the originating summons filed by Adamu Atta, the plaintiff alleged that Akwati Udwahan did not win the primary election of the PDP and therefore her nomination should be nullified. In opposing the suit, Usman filed a preliminary objection arguing that the originating summons is unendorsed as required by law, therefore incredible incompetence and deprive the court of its jurisdiction. In its judgment, the court agreed with Usman that the suit was improperly commenced and the court lacks jurisdiction to hear an incompetent suit. The Nigerian constitution does not have adequate provisions to address statelessness in the country. As according to the Minister of Interior, who was speaking in Abuja at the launch of the National Action Plan and the inauguration of the High-Level Steering Committee, to eradicate citizens in the country. With the launch of the action plan, Nigeria has been added to the list of nine countries with national plans to address the issue and ensure those affected by and vulnerable to the adverse effects of statelessness get the justice they need. Our correspondent, Kayla Megwa, has more. Statelessness has recently assumed an alarming dimension, and that has necessitated this gathering of stakeholders from the United Nations, the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Interior, and Women Affairs to assess what the United Nations calls a human rights violation. It is estimated that at least 4.3 million persons around the world are denied a nationality. As a result, they are often, as we heard the Director of Citizenship mention, they are often not allowed or able to enroll uh, or go to school, to see a doctor, get a job, open a bank account, own a SIM card, and all these require identification. In international law, a stateless person is a person not considered as a national by any state under the operation of its law. As of 2018, the United Nations revealed there are 12 million stateless people in the world. The Minister of Humanitarian Affairs highlights some of the actionable steps in Nigeria's action plan to handle this problem. Publish a qualitative study for to scale up SMS issuance of birth registration and file to undertake laws, law reforms on registration of children born on Nigerian territory. The Minister of Interior highlights a few of the areas where the Nigerian constitution did not cater to victims of statelessness. A child that's abandoned at birth, whose parents cannot be determined, is stateless by Nigerian law. Chapter 3, section 26, subsection 1 to 2 is this constitutional provision ignores the grant of Nigerian citizenship to foreign men or husband of Nigerian women in the same manner. To quit the female foreigners married to Nigerian men or husband is further than the further of discrimination. Representatives of the government that are here, please quickly. As stated by many of the participants in today's event, statelessness in Nigeria is mainly caused by lapses, especially considering the fact that Nigeria's constitution has no provision for statelessness. And that's the reason why this committee has been set up, to address these gaps that have been caused by these lapses and to help all those who have fallen through the cracks caused by this problem. Kayla Megua, Channels Television News.
To the fight against insurgency in Adamawa State, Governor Maru Fintiri is raising the alarm that the terror group Boko Haram is planning to regroup and establish a base for its operations in the state. The governor made the disclosure when he received the newly deployed brigade commander, 23rd Armored Brigade, Brigadier General Muhammad Gambo, in his office in Yola, the Adamawa State Capital. He says intelligence reports reveal the two locations where the terrorists intend to set up their operational base are in Hong and Maiha local government areas of the state. Boko Haram are trying to establish about two cells within the state. And the local government of Maiha and that of uh, Hong and, and, and Gombe. And I'm happy and glad to have hear from you directly that immediately you are sworn into action and you have visited uh, this uh, area so that you have come up. And I also believe definitely you must have done something concrete to ensure that these cells are dismantled and uh, uh, we ensure also that uh, it doesn't go beyond what they have started. Yes, I'm not saying that they are there already, but all of us know that there are indications that they are trying to establish their cells in, 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 in Maya. A lot of effort have been done within the last one month to ensure that uh, uh, we dismantle them and uh, we are monitoring them and we will ensure also that we put all uh, uh, her efforts to ensure that we support all the security agencies to, to make our people stay good to have their eyes closed. In other stories now, the House of Representatives Ad Hoc Committee on Fuel Consumption has begun assessment of the daily volume of petroleum products consumed in the country. The chairman of the committee, Uzoma Abonta, explains that the exercise became necessary in view of the current debate on the removal of fuel subsidy and that the committee's report will be used by the House of Representatives to present their position on the subsidy issue. We're speaking after an oversight visit to tank farms in Calabar, across the state capital. Well, this is a special House ad hoc committee on um, trying to find out the volume of products being consumed in the country. Well, we're here in search of or trying to discover the finals that certain the product consumption uh, daily and so on for the house to use as an indicator to calculate other issues. This topical issue called um, subsidy is the uh, bedeviled Niger for a long while and you can't get or calculate subsidy without knowing volume. Subsidy is directly uh, the quantity or quality of fuel consumed that again you can calculate that so if we get right what we're looking for the house will be in a better position to redirect or properly place this issue of a subsidy or to do otherwise outside the country now as part of measures to advance the global net zero emissions targets and facilitate energy access for african countries the Vice President, Yemi Oshibadra, is proposing a debt for climate swap deal. In a statement by his media aide, the Vice President made a call during a lecture on a just and equitable energy transition for Africa at the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C. A debt for climate swap is one in which bilateral or multilateral debts are forgiven by creditors in exchange for a commitment by the debtor to use the outstanding debt service payments for national climate action programs. The vice president believes that the deal would increase the fiscal space for climate related investments and reduce the debt burden for participating developing countries. Professor Shibajo has been in the US since Wednesday, accompanied by members of Nigeria's Energy Transition Implementation Working Group to seek global partnerships and support for Nigeria's recently launched energy transition plan. Nigeria needs $410 billion to deliver the transition plan by 2060. In part two after the break, ahead of the 2023 general elections, the International Republican Institute moves to equip female candidates with the knowledge to enable them to prosecute their electoral agenda. That's the moment to join us again.
joined us to watch the news at 10 live on channels television lagos here's a reminder of our top stories high court is in joss discharges and acquits former governor of plateau state juna jang of 6.3 billion naira fraud it says prosecution lacked evidence to prove the allegations against the accused preparations in top care for next year's election and ahead of that the international republican institute says there is need to equip female candidates with the required knowledge to enable them effectively prosecute their agenda. To address this, the IRI, in partnership with Women's Democracy Network, has met with female candidates under the People's Democratic Party in Abuja. Issues deliberated upon border on campaign management, overcoming the barriers of women's political representation, campaign policy planning, and efficient use of the various media platforms to publicize their campaigns. You are all leaders in your own right working to uh, achieve robust and resilient democracy and we all recognize that achieving robust and resilient democracy requires equal participation of men and women. More specifically in this training we hope to provide you with the tools to fully and effectively participate in the electoral process to improve your leadership skills to help you deal with barriers to inclusivity, to run policy-driven campaigns, to maximize your interactions with the media, to develop smart campaign strategies, to manage conflict, and to truly reach your constituents or the constituents that you are hoping to represent. Finally, I will say that, as you all know, Nigeria is at a critical moment in history. There are great opportunities ahead of us. There are also great risks. Our mission here is to support the people, the society, and the government of Nigeria in deepening democracy and achieving good governance. And that's important because it not only affects Nigerians and Nigeria, but will have impacts far beyond Nigeria's borders. You have a critical role to play in this effort, not just in breaking barriers uh, to political inclusion, but also in improving the professionalism of the entire process. In the meantime, expectations are high on measures to be taken to make the forthcoming 2023 polls credible. A part of them is the Electoral Offences Commission bill, currently before the National Assembly, a legislation being proposed to tackle the menace of vote trading, among others. In view of this, civil society organizations have been calling for a speedy passage of the bill. In this next report, our correspondent, Edwin Gashiru, examines the different inherent, the dangers inherent in vote trading in the run up to the general elections next year. As Nigeria heads to the 2023 general elections, with barely seven months to go, at a glance, the coast seems clear as the president remains upbeat in his promise to deliver a credible poll. But on the second thought, the AKT and Osho elections have left some strong reminder of some major landmines as the nation pedal the streams of another political transition. And this is the issue of vote trading. On a high-level surveillance at the Akiti governorship elections just June this year, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, had launched a raid at the hideout, allegedly flagged up for vote trading. While this is under investigation, the civil society organizations continue to raise alarm on the dangers of vote buying as a push for the speedy passage of the Electoral Offenses Commission Act. We must compel INEC to gather some of the cases of vote buying that they have already identified and take them through the court system. And we must compel the judiciary to act on an accelerated path. We need to scrutinize 
that bill. So they don't serve us a legislation that will just remove the burden, but it will not be prosecuting the vote buyers and the vote traders. It will not be prosecuting, you know, politicians that recruit talks to disrupt elections uh, and also reduce um, electoral offenses. After securing 60 convictions from 125 cases on electoral offenses, the Independent National Electoral Commission is making a strong case for the establishment of a commission to deal specifically on electoral offenses, which includes vote buying and selling. INEC is saddled with the responsibility of prosecuting electoral offenders under the Electoral Act. This has been very challenging for the Commission. The National Assembly began public hearing on the establishment of the Electoral Offenses Commission Bill, but the EFCC is voicing a strong opposition as it maintains the provision for the Act is already covered under the Penal and Criminal Codes, the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Act 2000 and the EFCC Establishment Act of 2004. The public hearing on the Electoral Offenses Commission Bill is a fallout of several electoral reforms committees set up by the diff at different times by the government. These committees have made recommendations bothering on financial and administrative independence and are bundling the Independent National Electoral Commission INEC, introducing of electronic voting, establishment of political parties tribunal and electoral offenses commission. Considering the high level conspiracy in this clandestine act of vote trading, the electoral gatekeepers would have to step up their roles in checking the vote trading monster, which stands between the hope of Nigerians and the mandate of delivering a free and fair elections in 2023 until the Electoral Offenses Commission Act is passed. Tackling vote trading seems much of a precarious situation, more like if the hunter has learned to shoot without missing. The bird now representing the vote traders would have to fly without perching. Benga Ashiru, reporting for Channel's Television News. Let's also sort of now to my colleague in Abuja, Terry Kumi, for more on the News at 10. Great to see you, Terry. Well, hello, Amarachi. I found that closing really interesting. Well, there seems to be no end in sight to the face-off between the Police Service Commission and the Nigeria Police Force, as the staff of the commission have vowed to continue their ongoing strike. They are protesting what they term the usurpation of the constitutional role of the commission by the Nigeria Police Force. Chairman of the Joint Union Congress of Police Service Commission, Mr. Doyo Augustin, at a news conference in Abuja today, criticized the chairman of the PSC for not defending the roles of the commission. The PSC has been at loggerheads with the police force over issues of recruitment, promotion, and disciplining of airing officers. <laughs> Our concern is that everything that makes the Police Service Commission function for the benefit of the Nigerian people, with respect to its constitutional mandate, are paramount to us. The Commission continues to abdicate its responsibilities, resulting in complaints of sharp practices and lopsided opportunities in the Nigerian police force, which is supposed to be serviced by the Commission as a constitutional responsibility. It is only the personnel of the Nigerian police force that do not sit for promotion examinations before they are promoted. This is a violation of the public service rules and other extant rules and en that encourage merit-driven promotion and it must stop henceforth. Yes. Today is the fifth day of our strike action while we are on strike, we have continued to lobby management to listen to the voice of reason and among other pressing needs, stand up immediately to defend the constitution of the Federal Republic of, Ni of Nigeria. Anything short of this will leave us no choice but to use all lawful instruments. We shall demand for, this re for his resignation to pave way for a competent and law-abiding citizen whose leadership would respect the letters and spirit of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria.
Meanwhile, the Inspector General of Police, Usman Al-Kalibaba, has urged the United Nations to make policies that will promote sustainable peace and development amongst its member nations. Mr. Babas, Mr. Al-Kalibaba is also asking the global body to continuously render necessary assistance towards improving policing systems across the globe. He stated this as he joined his counterparts from other parts of the world at the third United Nations Chiefs of Police Summit in the United States of America. After addressing the summit, the IGP later met with the Under Secretary General, Department of Peace Operations, at the UN headquarters, Mr. Jean Pierre Lacroix, and UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed. The IGP is later scheduled to meet with the Director of the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Agency, a United States agency that has been supportive in the training and capacity building programs of the Niger Police Force. Now, Nigerian hip-hop recording artist Ice Prince Zamani, who was arrested by the Lagos State Police Command for alleged abduction and assault in a police officer, has been remanded at the Ikui Correctional Center. This followed an order by a magistrate court sitting in the Aja area of Lagos after he was arranged today. The Oleku Kruna was dragged before the court and charged on three counts, including assault, obstructing a policeman from carrying out his statutory duties and abduction. When the counts were read to him, the defendant pleaded not guilty. Magistrate Taiwo Yaniyi subsequently granted him bail in the sum of 500,000 naira, and he is also to furnish the court with two responsible sureties. Pending when he meets the bail conditions, the magistrate ordered his, rem his remand and adjourned further proceedings in the case till September the 7th, 2022. The police say there is video evidence which shows what transpired between them and which will be presented in court. Now, when the news at 10 returns, global food prices drop for the fifth consecutive month in August, according to latest report from the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the News at 10. Now, after five weeks of intense audition, the Niger Delta talent hunt has been concluded with 21-year-old Elvis Luna emerging the winner of the first edition of the show put together by the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC. The initiative was flagged off by the NDDC Interim Administrator, F. Yongakwa, on July 20th, 2022, with the aim of discovering fresh talent in the Niger Delta for the entertainment industry. <laughs> The Niger Delta Talent Hunt is a youth development initiative of the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, with the sole aim of harnessing the creative and entertainment potentials of the Niger Delta youth. After five weeks of intense auditions across the nine states and the region, these ten contestants were the last men and women standing in Port Harcourt, the River State capital, with the high hopes of going home with a coveted grand prize. So, to buy with Harrison an internship deal. The representative of the interim administrator of the NDDC, Ubong Abasi James, says the program is just a part of what the agency has in store for youths in the region, just as the director of youth and sports highlights the benefits of the program. What we are seeing here today and what we will see in the different states is just the beginning of the several good things that the commission uh, is going to put in place uh, for the youth of the Niger Delta. The program serves as a platform to connect with game changers in the entertainment industry through facilitated auditions and concerts to explore and yet collaborate and create new talents in the entertainment industry in the region. Before performances by the 10 finalists, the panel of judges take time to enumerate their expectations from the contestants. I can't wait to see passion. Okay. Passion is the only thing that drives the talent. Passion is the only thing that drives your talent. Whatever you're doing. So I want to see the passion in what you're doing, how they're delivering, how they're bringing out their ACs. That's what I want. Talent goes beyond what's coming out of you, what's outside. It's from the inside, you have to love it. Let's see the love of it, let's see the spirit come through. One after the other, the 10 finalists mount the stage to showcase their talents, leading to eliminations based on the decision of the judges. Oh. 
Next, this 21-year-old singer, Elvis Luna, is announced winner of the talent hunt, much to the delight of the audience. Elvis Luna is rewarded with a brand new car and a trip to Dubai as well as an internship deal. First of all, I didn't want to come for this competition, but the pressure of my family members and everybody put on my voice, my friends, I, I just had to do it and I'm really grateful for everything. For each and every one of you that supported, thank you so much. I'm, I'm excited, I'm very excited. While the first runner-up, Ms. Honest Damasumawe, a comedian, goes home with two million naira. Just as the second runner-up, Ms. Precious, Ogesoba, a singer, gets one million naira cash reward. So beautiful to encourage talent. Uh, well, that's all from the nation's capital. Back to you, Marachi. Thank you, Terry. And their reaction is everything, isn't it? Go back in Lagos, the traffic situation along the Bega Kara Opi corridor on the Lagos Sibada Expressway may get more challenging. With more repair works scheduled to start tomorrow, repairs are to replace three expansion joints on the Ibadan bound lane of the Kara Bridge section of the highway to prevent accidents uh, and damages to vehicles. Now, according to the acting federal controller of works in Lagos State, this is follow. Oroshala Oloyede, a work is in furtherance uh, to the ongoing reconstruction of the Bega Opic axis of the highway. The east commuting traffic will be diverted to the inbound lane of the Kara Bridge for the period the repair works would last. The Lagos State Traffic Management Authority, LASMA, will collaborate with the federal government, with the Federal Road Safety Corps and Ogun State Traffic Compliance and Enforcement Corps to manage traffic during the period. saw so the lowest funding for the education sector since 2015. In addition to insecurity, primary education in Nigeria is under enormous strain. In continuation of our series on the state of primary education in the country, this next report looks at its funding in Nigeria's north central states and how this is impacting enrollment in the region. Out-of-school children in Nigeria rose from 10.5 million in 2021 to 18.5 million in 2022. According to the United Nations Children's Fund, 9 million of that figures are from the northern parts of the country. Insecurity is just a part of this many-pronged problem. Poor funding is already an existing problem, and it's gotten worse over the years, especially for primary school education. In Niger State, some primary schools are suffering different levels of deterioration. The Director of Planning, Research and Statistics, Niger State Universal Basic Education Board, Subeb, Mr. Umar Suleiman Tagagi, revealed that access to the 2020 and 2021 counterpart funding poses the biggest threat to primary school infrastructure in the state. Nevertheless, the state believes there is an improvement in the number of out-of-school children in the state. If they provide that counterpart now, the UBEC will now release its own part to make it. And if they can release this two years uh, matching grant, you see that we have volume of works again to be carried out in the state, which the gap you are seeing will, will be reduced drastically. The Kwaro State government claims it spent 14.2 billion naira on the construction and renovation of primary schools in the state in the past three years to reduce the number of out-of-school children in the state. When we came in in 2019, one of the letters on my table was a letter from WIAC uh, telling us to pay 30 million naira or else um, we wouldn't be able to take the blacklisters just like UBEC did. We promptly paid that, paying salaries and trying to run a government capital project it was something that is a big challenge. 
The Benue state government has invested over 21.5 billion naira in a joint counterpart funding of basic education across the 23 local government areas in which it contributed over 10.7 billion naira to reconstruct and rebuild over 2,000 public schools. I think we can beat our chest that the state has done very well as, found, as far as assessing counterpart funding made available by uh, UBEC is concerned. We are right now working to assess the current 2022 um, counterpart funding that is available. The International Center for Investigative Reporting reports that funding in the education sector has dropped from 7.92% in 2016 to 4.3% in 2022, the lowest allocation since 2015. However, the Kogi state government says building infrastructure to create a conducive environment for teaching and learning in the state is a priority. As a matter of fact, we have two years for the waiting for you back now to credit us. His Excellency have made provisions of the money. It's in the account. You better come and do the needs. I said, come and do what you need to do. We are just through 2021 now. And of course, maybe in the next two weeks, you will see activities commencing again in the state. Despite these claims by state governments in Nigeria's North Central, in addition to multiple attacks on schools by bandits in recent times in the region, funding for primary education is at its lowest since 2015, while out-of-school children in northern Nigeria accounts for 69% of Nigeria's out-of-school children. For Nigeria to meet SDG 4, which is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all by 2030, it must increase its budget for the education sector from 4.3 percent it allocated in 2022 to 20 percent. Mamador, a range of quality products that helps consumers explore great tasting and nourishing meals, has concluded the third edition of its women's meeting in Lagos. The early August meeting received entries from women across the country with six entrepreneurs being chosen and rewarded with a total of one million naira. Speaking at the event, the head of marketing, PZ Wilma Choma Mbanugo, explains that the meeting is a wake-up call for women to step into a world of endless possibilities. Over the years, Mamador, a premium brand of PZ Wilma, has made strong contributions to the Nigerian society, championing women's causes and supporting the initiative for an August meeting for women from the Eastern Region. In the era of COVID-19, the initiative transformed to virtual meeting, then went hybrid in 2021. Now comes the third edition holding physically in Lagos. The kind of impact we've been able to make over the years, so it's three years now, and the kind of message we've been able to drive with these women. And that gives us um, joy as a team down here that we are able to make this kind of impact. When you look at the businesses of these female entrepreneurs, it's not... Members of the right panel now. educate participants on how best to harness their potential so as they provide tasty meals through their healthy cooking oil, which they say is cholesterol-free and proven to keep the heart healthy. Between mothering, wifing, XYZ, we lose ourselves. So it's a call to remembering who exactly you are and not letting that talent, that skill, that unique thing about you die. You're going to be on maternity leave and your male colleague will not be. Mm. You need to come to the reality of that. They're going to be out of, for four months. So those realities, how do you now sit with those realities and understand how do I be the best of myself within that reality? The company highlights how the brand, through its products, Mamador Cooking Oil and Margarine, serves as a motivator to women in exploring their limitless sides and aims to achieve fulfillment in their chosen endeavors. Mamado is doing a lot to ensure that women out there find their what and they're able to explore their flavors. So Mamado is there to ensure that no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you want to do, it is valid and you are able to achieve that which you want to achieve.
Please remember you can use It's not talk all the way. August Winners also emerge from telling their Explore Your Flavor story. I'm very grateful. Thank you so much for the opportunity to um, talk about my, my dreams and thank you for supporting it through your competition and funding this. Thank you so much. I'm glad to announce that we won 100,000 Naira and that will help us to carry the campaign to a larger audience. The management of this brand says they will continue to inspire women to pursue those passions and dreams that may have been forgotten owing to changing life conditions. Let's get a taste of business news now. Here's Anne Mawodo. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thank you, Marachi. Hello and welcome to Business News. The United Nations Global Food Prices Index has fallen for the fifth month in a row with a sign that one of the main pressures pushing up the cost of living around the world could ease. Its latest food price index shows that the prices of five commodities that cereals, vegetable oil, dairy, meat and sugar were lower in the month of August than in July. In July this year, a landmark agreement to unblock Ukraine grain exports amid the ongoing war was signed by the country, Russia, Turkey and the United Nations. And Africa's leading rating agency, GCR, has upgraded the short-term and long-term issuer ratings for Lagos State's program 3, Series 2, Series 3, and Series 4 senior unsecured bond issuances to A1+, Plus and AA, and that's according to a stable outlook. In a statement released today, the ratings agency says the upgrade is a result of a generation and diversified internal economy, which has now supported robust growth in internally generated revenue. Meanwhile, the GCR has hinged its stable outlook for the state on expectations of continued robust revenue growth and sound expenditure management, despite anticipated rise in debt level. The Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, Dr. Mohamed Abubakar, is expressing optimism that the ban on Nigeria's agricultural commodities by the European Union and the United States of America will be lifted very soon. At the briefing by the Standing Interministerial Technical Committee on Agro Zero Reject Initiative on Abuja, Mr. Abubakar says the current effort being made by the federal government is to ensure Nigerian agricultural produce is accepted in the international market. We head to the market now where it ended the week in the green. Nearly 200 billion Naira, that's the amount gained by investors within three days. Will Ebong tells us more. Welcome to the stock market report. A major win for equities as the NGX sustained the positive sentiments seen at intraday to close in the green despite deep drops in some big stocks. Massive gains in MTN Nigeria, Zenith Bank and Eterna propelled the all share index to cross back to the 50,000 level and pumping the market value by about 85 billion naira. The financial sector dominated activities today. FCMB climbed up the leaderboard more than 9% to close at 3 naira 49 kobo. We also see a rise in the share prices of Stambik and e transact. And this is reflected in the banking counter as the index rose almost 1%. We do have stocks at the short end of the stick and McNichols let that counter down more than 9% to close that 67 cover. It appears the NGS has erased major losses and looks set to end the week in the green. And that's the stock market report. I'm Will Ebong, back to you. Business News Tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawodo. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with Amarachi. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks a lot, Anne. Leaders have been condemning the assassination attempt on Argentina Vice President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, who escaped unhurt after a man pointed a loaded gun at her head, which fell to fire. While authorities say they're investigating whether the attacker, a Brazilian national who was arrested on the spot, acted alone, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Pope Francis, who is from Argentina, have condemned the attempt. 
Mr. Blinken said the U.S. stood with the Argentine government and people in rejecting violence and hate. Pope Francis expressed his solidarity and closeness in this delicate moment. Simon Pusey has more on this in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Argentina's vice president has narrowly avoided assassination after a gunman's weapon jammed as he aimed it at her. Footage shows the moment Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, surrounded by a mob of supporters, found herself face to face with the loaded weapon. Police said the gunman, who local media identified as a 35-year-old Brazilian man, has been taken into custody. They are attempting to establish a motive for the attack on the left-leaning politician, who was Argentina's president from 2007 to 2015, and its first lady for four years before that. President Alberto Fernandez revealed the gun was loaded with five bullets, but failed to fire when triggered. In a TV address to the nation, he said, this is the most serious event we have gone through since Argentina returned to democracy. A military-run court in Myanmar has sentenced Aung San Suu Kyi to a further three years in prison on election fraud charges. Ms. Suu Kyi, the country's former leader, has now been sentenced to 20 years in prison on 11 counts, with several charges remaining. She denies all of the accusations, and the trials have been condemned by rights groups as politically motivated. If convicted on all charges, she could face almost 200 years in prison. The 77-year-old Nobel laureate has spent most of her time in detention under house arrest in the capital, Norpitor. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa and U.S. President Joe Biden will hold talks on the 16th of September on a number of issues, including trade and energy. That's according to the White House. It comes weeks after the South African president met U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. A White House statement said the leaders will discuss opportunities to deepen our cooperation on trade and investment, infrastructure, climate and energy and health. It added that the presidents would also reaffirm the partnerships between their two countries and discuss working together to address regional and global challenges. Salvage teams have rushed to pump fuel off a grounded ship after it collided with a gas tanker off Gibraltar and began leaking fuel oil into the sea. Authorities said there had been a significant leak from the OS-35 on Thursday and booms were deployed in an attempt to stop the oil spreading. By Friday morning, the British Overseas Territory said 80% of the ship's diesel fuel had been removed. The chief minister described the next 48 hours as crucial. A debate in the Liechtenstein parliament on the subject of earthquake insurance had to be suspended because of an earthquake. Bettina petzold Mar initially laughs off the first tremor. <laughs> But the second one was stronger, measuring 3.9 magnitude. In diesem Zusammenhang dann auch die Frage. Forcing the Speaker of the Chamber to pause proceedings. Das wird langsam heftig. Ich glaube, man weiß ja nie wegen Nachbeben. Wir machen mal eine Viertelstunde Pause. Extinction Rebellion supporters have entered the House of Commons debating chamber and superglued themselves around the Speaker's chair. We are in crisis, and what goes on in this room every single day makes a joke out of all of us. Video and photos posted on social media by the group show five people inside the chamber holding banners reading Let the People Decide and Citizens Assembly Now. The House was not in session at the time. The group also hung a large banner bearing the same words from scaffolding on the estate. Britain's House of Commons said it was dealing with the incident as a matter of urgency. And finally, a two-headed tortoise called Janus will celebrate his 25th birthday this weekend, making him the world's oldest bicephalic tortoise. To keep him on form, carers feed him organic salad and give him daily massages and baths in green tea and chamomile. Janus, who has two heads, two hearts and two sets of lungs, but only one digestive system, is under constant surveillance in case he flips over. A two-headed tortoise would not ordinarily survive long in the wild, since it cannot retract its heads into its shell to seek shelter from predators and that's your international news around the world in five now back to the channel studios in lagos
many thanks, Marachi. Time now for some sports news. Super Eagles Team B coach Salisu Yusuf believes his team can overturn their 2-0 first leg deficit against Ghana's Black Galaxies and qualify for the African Nations Championship. Well, the winner on aggregate will qualify for the 2023 African Nations Championship to be hosted by Algeria. Arsenal manager Mikel Ateta is happy with the squad depth following the club's business in the transfer window, despite failing to attempt to failing in the attempt rather to sign a midfielder after injuries to Thomas Partey and Mohamed El Nani. Well, the Gunners sought to address the situation on transfer deadline day as they made a late move for Aston Villa's Douglas Luiz. In boxing, United, unified world heavyweight boxing champion Alexander Yusik says he's seeking to set up a unification bout with Britain's Tyson Fury in 2023. The 35-year-old Ukrainian won his rematch against Anthony Joshua last month to retain the IBF, WBA and WBO titles in just his fourth fight in the division. WBC champion Fury announced his latest retirement in August but has signaled his willingness to resume his career if the promoters can stop up 500 million pounds. And that's Rappin Sports News. I'm Ayo Tunde Balobo. Thanks a lot, Ayo Tunde. And the main news again the Federal High Court sitting in Joss today discharged and acquitted the former governor of Plateau State, Juna Jang, of 6.3 billion naira corruption charges. The court said the prosecution lacked evidence to prove the allegations against the accused. That is the news at 10 tonight. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Good night and enjoy the weekend.